Hey, greetings and welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am your host, Lockheed and Liberal. And I do want to thank you all so much for being here with me today. Uh, if you are new to the program, I especially want to welcome you. Uh, this is a podcast where we are going to be discussing uh, legal theory and moral philosophy as it relates to current events surrounding law, politics, and culture. And if you are new to the show, this, you picked a very, very good day to join us because today uh, I have an interview with the great Scott Horton. Now, Scott is the founder of the Libertarian Institute, along with uh, Sheldon Richmond, uh, Peter Quinones, and Kyle Anzalone. Uh, and they are really a stellar source for news, journalism, education, and activism uh, from a libertarian perspective. And they have some great regular contributors, who, uh, including myself, in an unofficial capacity at least, uh, I've been sending uh, submissions to them, and they're usually kind enough to publish them, which is awesome. Uh, but Scott is also the editorial director of Antiwar.com. Uh, and this is a site that has really become a legend in its own time, almost. Really known and respected by people across the political spectrum. Uh, Scott is also the host of Antiwar Radio uh, on Pacifica 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. And Scott is the host of the Scott Horton Show, which can be found at scotthorton.org, where you can find every episode uh, in a catalog that consists of more than 5,500 interviews going all the way back to 2003. He is also the author of the 2021 book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terror, uh, the 2017 book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, uh, and the editor of the 2019 book, The Great Ron Paul, which is a collection of interviews that Scott has done with Ron Paul over the years on The Scott Horton Show. Now, in this interview, I learned uh, quite a lot from speaking to Scott. Uh, one of the things that I learned, I guess, unfortunately, is that I'm not nearly as good at conducting interviews as I thought. And, uh, it's not unlike what happened last time when we uh, had an interview, uh, the one that had such serious AV issues, uh, that the footage was just completely uh, unusable. Uh, and I had assumed that that's why it went poorly then was because of those issues. But unfortunately, <laughs> it wasn't any better this time around. Uh, but I don't, I don't want you to get me wrong here. This is still a really, really good episode. Uh, still a very interesting discussion with a lot of really interesting information from Scott. The reason I give this caveat is because my intention had been to talk to him about his book uh, and to ask him the questions that I had gotten from many of you guys. Uh, however, I managed to really do neither of those things, which just seems kind of, I don't know, unfair to Scott, who was expecting to discuss his book, and unfair to you guys because I asked you for questions and uh, which I asked him, but because I really didn't understand the deeper context and meaning behind those questions, they were unfortunately just simply unanswerable for him. Uh, but anyways, hopefully at some point in the future, he will be willing to come on again and we can, can try to have the interview that I would have liked to have uh, that I think both he and all of you deserve. Uh, to, and anyways, though, like I said... This really is still a great discussion, uh, and I think you're really going to like it. Uh, we talk about the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party. We talk about Defend a Guard, as well as a really, really interesting discussion about everything going on right now with the Israel-Palestine conflict. And there is plenty more as well. So I encourage you guys to go uh, check out his new book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terror. I will have links down in the description to where you can get yourself a copy of that book as well as links down there in the description to all the different places where you can follow Scott at, such as the, Liber the Libertarian Institute, Antiwar.com, the Scott Horton Show, and so on. So uh, without further ado, uh, here is my uh, conversation with Scott Horton. All right, and we are live. And I am talking right now to Scott Horton here. 
Uh, this is the Categorical Imperatives of Course, the podcast uh, where we discuss legal theory and moral philosophy with current events surrounding law, politics, and culture. Uh, and I'm talking to Scott Horton uh, once again for the first time, so to speak. Uh, I, I had him on once before, and we had some issues, so he's been uh, kind enough to give me a mulligan here. Uh, so he is the founder of the Libertarian Institute. Uh, he is the editorial director of Antiwar.com. He is the host of Antiwar Radio uh, on 90.7 in Los Angeles. And he is the uh, author of two books, including uh, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terror and Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And he is the host, of course, of the Scott Horton Show. He has recorded over uh, 5,500 interviews. Uh, so, Scott, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk with you a bit uh, first, if we can, about uh, the Mises Caucus. If that's all right. Of whatever's on your mind, I'm here. All right, cool. Yeah, because um, the last time I talked to you, uh, you were about to go to an event in uh, Pittsburgh for the Libertarian Party. Uh, and since then, that has happened. Uh, and that was just um, really interesting to watch. I mean, it really... Uh, I, I, I was fortunate enough to watch uh, your speech along with others such as, you know, Dave Smith and uh, Jeff Dice. And it was really exciting because it re really confirmed something that I felt for a while that uh, really the Mises Caucus is uh, possibly sort of picking up right where the, uh, the Ron Paul revolution seemed to fall off in 2012 as far as really making real change for, uh, you know, for, for peace and prosperity. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that. And uh, can you tell me a bit about the Mises Caucus and what you're about? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the plan. Absolutely, is to restart the Ron Paul revolution and this time using the Libertarian Party as the vehicle. And, you know, to essentially create on the presidential level another of the best speaking tours on behalf of peace and liberty that can be uh, given. And then on the state level, We'd like to see libertarians elected to things. I mean, hell, and I, honestly, this is the silver bullet in the U.S. Constitution that this part they still have to obey is that the House of Representatives is divided up into these 435 little house districts. And so it is within the realm of possibility in the right circumstances for a libertarian to win a House seat in the U.S. House. But on the state level, there's all kinds of possibilities open for getting uh, House and Senate members elected in the right times and places if we play our cards right and pick the right candidates and the right time, you know, the right places where a seat is more open than usual and and our libertarian has a little bit deeper roots in the community than the average guy or, you know, something where we really have an opportunity to get people elected to uh, state houses and state Senate seats. And for that matter, um, you know, in many states, judges are elected locally and, you know, real hard uh, shoe rubber meets the road type campaigns could make a real difference in a lot of those and, and really even succeed in a lot of those, I think, um, you know, if it's done right. So and if we can bring enough of the libertarian movement into the party to make the party a big enough and hardcore enough and exciting enough thing to bring even more people into it, to really make it a much bigger force in American politics than it has been. And so I think the sky's the limit. And we got a lot of great people in here. I just got off the line with Tom Woods. We were talking about the same thing. The oh, nice. amount of potential that we have here is essentially unlimited. Yeah, and that was really what was so exciting about watching uh, a lot of the Pittsburgh event is just the energy in the room. I, I was really surprised by how uh, excited and how motivated the crowd was. And I, I mean, they really, it seemed like there was a lot of people really behind this movement and that was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's really something else. And, and Dave Smith's speech in Pittsburgh just, you know, blew everybody's socks off. The man's Absolutely. got a presence. Well, and, and yours too, and yours too. Potential. Actually, and yours, um, it really, um, touched on a lot of questions that I was, uh, going to ask you today about Israel and Palestine, and uh, I think I might possibly uh, refer people uh, to that speech. I'll, I'll be putting a link to uh, that uh, the uh, the speech that you gave there. I'll of course be putting a link to all your other sites uh, 
Libertarian Institute, Scott Horton Show, uh, Antiwar.com, all of that down in the description for this video, of course. Um, but yeah, your speech was just really exciting. It was really interesting to see people so uh, so so excited uh, for a talk about foreign policy. Well, you know, I've always believed, well, for a very long time, that if the Americans knew the truth about the situation in Israel, Palestine, that they would side with the poor Palestinians in this situation. And that the reason they don't is because they really don't know the first thing about it. And they hear a bunch of slogans like, well, what if someone is shooting a rocket at you? Oh, well, boy, I'd try to get out of the way and then shoot back, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but this kind of argument is just completely devoid of context. And nobody. Yeah, it... Oh, go ahead. Go Sorry. Ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, it, it's really uh, frustrating to see a lot of people, uh, even uh, good people, it seems like libertarians or constitutional conservatives who will say, well, you know, Israel is is just defending itself. Doesn't it have the right to defend itself? It, it, it's just such an absurd uh, a point to make there. Well, the thing, what it is, is it's a logical fallacy, right? It's called begging the question, where essentially you're sneaking your conclusion into the uh, argument in the first place. And so the conclusion that you're trying to force people to accept is that what Israel is doing is that they're defending themselves. Of course, everyone has the right to defend themselves. The question is, who's the aggressor and who's the defender? But instead, they change that question to, doesn't Israel have the right to defend themselves, which just presumes that that's what they're doing, when obviously it's not. And the thing of it is this. They want to pretend that somehow the Palestinian territories are independent from their rule, but they're not. You know, the Egyptians and the Jordanians controlled that territory until 67. And then Israel started that war against Egypt and then Jordan jumped in and they both lost, uh, Egypt and Jordan did, and Israel took control, not just of Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem, but of all those people. And they actually kicked another two, 250,000 people out of the country uh, in an ethnic cleansing campaign again in 67. But they still cut millions of Palestinians. They essentially kidnapped them all, took possession of them all. And so they pretend, though, they want to have it both ways and say, well, there's Hamas, not Israel. Hamas controls the Gaza Strip. And the Palestinian Authority, not Israel, controls the West Bank. But that's just not true. These are essentially subcontractors. These are like trustees in Israel's prison. This is like an Indian reservation where the leaders are picked by the occupiers, not by their own people at all. And don't they just and get Mahmoud like a couple Abbas, votes in the in the Israeli uh, parliament or whatever it is? Well, inside well, what they call Israel proper within the 67 borders, there's a 80-20 super duper Jewish majority. Right. And the one fifth of the population are Palestinian citizens of Israel, Muslims and Christians. And they do have representation in the Knesset. Um, although they are treated like second class citizens in many ways, and they're never included in the ruling coalition or, you know, given power over any of the ministries. So it is very limited representation in that way. But so this is the thing, right? is they conflate all these issues together. But what we're talking about is in the occupied territories where the people have no representation in the Israeli government whatsoever. If they have any representation at all, it's with Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and yet they don't. The Palestinian Authority is not elected. Mahmoud Abbas was not elected by the people of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And Gaza was only sort of elected. I mean, pardon me, Hamas was only sort of elected by the people of Gaza in the election of 2006, but that whole thing was essentially a setup where Connolly's Rice first, uh, Bush's secretary of state insisted they hold the election. Then the Israelis, and I don't know if this was deliberate. I mean, what they did was deliberate, but I don't know exactly what they were going for with the effect of this. It might've been as cynical as it seemed to be in the end, but I don't know. But essentially they, um, withheld all of the tax revenue 
from the uh, Palestinian Authority under the control of Fatah, Yasser Arafat's party, the leftist party. And essentially, so they couldn't pay uh, salaries and they couldn't, you know, pay their patronage. And so they were essentially thrown out. They were the the old guard and Gaddafi, I mean, pardon me, um, Arafat was, uh, the Israelis had murdered him by then, uh, poisoning him with a radioactive polonium. And then, um, Wait, Gaddafi? In the election, did you say, in the, huh? Did you say Gaddafi? No, no, no. I, I, yeah, I, I did, but I didn't mean to. I said yes or Arafaz, who I meant to say oh, there. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was just, yeah, I was just a uh, misspeaking. Um, oh, I got you. And so they murdered him with with polonium, and then his successor, Mahmoud Abbas, was never elected to anything. Uh, they held this election, and Hamas won the election. But then the Americans, the Israelis, and the Egyptians tried to do a coup in two thousand seven which failed. And so, whereas Hamas and the PA had to have a coalition. And again, we're talking about trustees in a prison. We're not talking about a sovereign government anyway. We're talking about who's ruling the imprisoned in their camp. And um, so Hamas essentially barely won. And so they had to form a coalition government with the Palestinian Authority. But then after this coup failed, Hamas routed the Palestinian Authority and kicked them out of the West, out of the Gaza Strip and into the West Bank. And so now Hamas rules in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority rules in the West Bank. And that just suits the Israelis just fine. It just means the Palestinians are that much more divided and conquered. In fact, I found a quote recently. A, a friend of mine who's an American Israeli uh, gave me a quote, uh, translated it for me from the Hebrew and everything. And uh, I tweeted it. You can find it on my Twitter feed where a leader of the Israeli Zionist Religious Party explains to the news that, look, Hamas is an asset. The Palestinian Authority, that's, you know, the tamer faction that rules in the West Bank, um, quote unquote rules, uh, they're a liability, you know, essentially because they're reasonable. Whereas Hamas, they are an asset. And then, as he puts it, in this game of delegitimization that we play, Hamas is an asset because Hamas can't go to the United Nations. Hamas can't go to the ICC. Hamas can get no sympathy from any member of the UN Security Council. So if that's all that we have to deal with, Hamas, we won't even need America's veto on the Security Council anymore to get whatever we want. And so, as always, the moderates and the reasonable men are the enemies of the terrorists on one side and the terrorists on the other, who would rather keep a strategy of tension and violence and fighting. And that's straight out of the horse's mouth. And that's why the Israeli government created, well, didn't create, but what abetted is? the rise of Hamas in the first place. It was a Indian kind of? In order to just divide and conquer them. I'm sorry, what? Well, I was going to say that they basically funded Hamas, didn't they? Uh, well, mostly what they did was they suppressed all of their competition and allowed them to thrive, was what okay. it really was. So it was, you know, I'm sure there was a bit of money there. Uh, but the major thing was they created the circumstances to make sure to, uh, again, because this is all an occupied reservation. This is not a sovereign state. So it was up to them to decide who goes to jail and who doesn't. And so like when they're when their uh, leader, Sheikh Yassin, they raided his house and found a bunch of weapons and they sentenced him to 20 years and let him out in two or something like that. Um, and then, of course, by the way, and Jeremy R. Hammond writes about this in his book, Obstacle to Peace, and detailed this in an interview on my show last week, that um, the reason they started abetting the rise of Hamas as a religious right wing alternative to the secular commie PLO was because of um, Yasser Arafat's coming to heel. And Arafat in 88 went ahead and recognized Israel within 67 borders as a part of his bid to try to get an independent Palestinian state. And so they said, you know, they always say the Palestinians, we have no partner for peace because the Palestinians are all such bad people. But the Israelis don't want a partner for peace. And whenever they do have a partner for peace, they do something to destroy it. So in this case, they helped abet the rise of Hamas in order to thwart Arafat's submission to them. 
So and you're then, saying that you're saying that Arafat was uh, essentially that he was uh, going to accept the sixty-seven borders with the, with the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and he was he, he was going to accept that as uh, what Israel territory, that. basically. He did that in nineteen eighty-eight. Really? Huh? Yeah. And so that yeah. was why that was why they abetted the rise of Hamas was to divide the Palestinians to make them easier to rule. They don't want a partner for peace. They want an evil terrorist enemy. And if Yasser Arafat's going to renounce terrorist violence, then he's no good to them. And so that was one of the main reasons that they supported the rise of Hamas. And then um, when um, when the leader of Hamas, Sheikh Yassin, started to mellow and decide that he would go ahead and announce that not that he recognized Israel yet, but that he would and he made it public that he would recognize Israel within 67 borders in a final status negotiation deal in, you know, based on the Saudi peace plan. And that if they got a two state solution, that even Hamas said that they would settle for their measly stinking 22 percent of what's left of Palestine there. And then they shot him and killed him with a missile, they, he, an old man in a wheelchair. And the Israelis bombed him and killed him. Because again, he was coming to heal. He was and submitting that seems like exactly to, what they want, though, or at least what they say what they want is, is the recognition of the sixty-seven borders, right? I mean, Israel. No, no, they want to steal all of the West Bank, and they want all the Palestinians there to drop dead. But they it, but don't the want a partner for peace. The they West want Bank? that land. But does, if you say the 67 borders, doesn't that include recognizing the West Bank as part of Israel then? No, 67 borders means before the war, before oh, they okay, conquered I the see. West Bank and Gaza. Oh, I, OK, I see. I understand now. Yeah. 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 So well, and then, uh, moving on, um, there was something else I wanted to talk to you about is uh, a uh, a program that you are very involved with called uh, Defend the Guard, uh, which is yeah. um, something that I don't think a lot of people know about, which to me seems like a really uh, important project. And I wanted to know if you could tell us um, just kind of uh, what they're about uh, and, and what your connection with them is and uh, how people can uh, get involved with that if they are interested in that. Yeah, well, I don't get any credit for it at all. I'm just uh, a big promoter of it and supporter of it, but it's Essentially, the idea was Pat McGeehan's uh, state representative from West Virginia and who's a combat veteran. And the idea was that the, they would pass a law that says that the president cannot nationalize their National Guard units, you know, their state National Guard units, unless they have an official declaration of war from the Congress, like in the Constitution. And of course, that's a giant poison pill because Congress will never take responsibility and declare war. And so the point being, well, if you're not going to declare war, then we're not going to fight in your undeclared wars. And people might uh, underestimate the role of the guard. They play a huge role in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially. But they also contribute special operations forces. And, you know, have their own Green Beret units and all kinds of things. They're incredibly diverse. Um, you know, a bunch of different uh, soldiers from the 50 states that have all different roles to play when they're supposed to be here in case there's a flood to, uh, you know, bag sand and, and stack bags. They're right. supposed to be here to help put out a forest fire that's threatening innocent people's lives and property or, you know, this kind of thing. That's what we expect uh, out of our National Guard. And, they're, and that's what our guardsmen expect when they sign up. And then they get sent off to go get their legs blown off in some stupid war that they should have never been in in the first place and that they didn't know they were signing up for, or, you know, might have thought that they were not going to be deployed to. And so um, there's a group called Bring Our Troops Home U.S. led by an Idaho Guard veteran named Dan McKnight from the Afghan war. And he put this group together and he's got a bunch of great guys and they're all combat vets at the leadership level. And they're all essentially Ron Paulian, libertarian, constitutionalist, Republican types. And so they have been pushing this and they're now in uh, working in concert with Young Americans for Liberty. They're getting this introduced in 50 states. 
uh, pardon me, no, 30 out of the 50 states is what I meant to say. Um, actually, I think it's 30 last year and 31 states this year. And so far, you know, we we're doing okay in Texas, but then they watered it down and turned it into this stupid thing. But that's to be expected. We've got another fight on our hands next year in Texas. Um, but then um, in Maine, it was close. It was really just came down to one guy opposing it. And if it hadn't been for him, it would have at least passed the Senate, this kind of thing. So anyway, um, we're going to keep pushing. And, you know, first of all, it sends the important signal that you've lost the infantry. How do you have a bunch of unending wars if people just don't want to fight them? And if everybody knows better and nobody believes in the lie anymore about why we have to do these things. And so, and then not only that, but it shows that, wow, and they're getting smart and they're getting organized and they're trying to influence their state parties and state governments to intervene on their behalf in the way that they have over legalizing pot and sanctuary cities for Im immigrants on one side and guns on the other and these kinds of things. And so here's something that both sides can believe on, right? The America first Republicans are over the wars and want the troops home. And I think the progressives said that's what they wanted all along too, right? And so um, this ought to be, and it has been, you know, uh, a bipartisan issue. You know, the bills have been signed and, co you know, co-sponsored uh, by people in both parties in many of these states although it's been led by Republicans, which again, is I think is the most important public relations message that can be sent there, that this is this kind of fed upness with the permanent state of war is really bubbling up and coming up from the right is really important for the narrative and then also through the states in this way. And, um, and then if we can really get it passed and sign into law, and a president wants to challenge it, then I guess we'll see. Because they're going to cite the supremacy clause, but the supremacy clause is for constitutional laws. And so, um, you know, the authorizations to use military force by our Congress are not declarations of war. And they are, and it's not just that they call it a weaker name because they're nationalizing less forces at the time or something like that. They truly are delegating their authority to declare war to the president. But that is not his role in a constitutional Republican system, not as described in Article One of this Constitution. And so um, it'd be a hell of a fight to see. And uh, especially if, if the resistance is being led from the right and from the Republican Party. I think it sends a hell of a statement. And so, listen, calling all combat veterans of these wars who are over it, you know, here's a group of guys that you can identify with and get along with and do good work together with. It's bringourtroopshome.us. And for you young kids who are, you know, Ron Paulian, libertarian and or, you know, right-leaning constitutionalists, um, you know, college kids and things like that, check out Young Americans for Liberty. They've been doing a lot of great work. They're founded oh, they're as, fantastic. you know, the the youth for Ron Paul or college kids for Ron Paul or whatever it was called, and and then grew into Young Americans for Liberty. And they really get work done. And so that's a, a couple of great organizations for people to team up with here. Yeah, absolutely. And what's funny is, as Rand Paul says, you know, um, the presidents, now they can start a war wherever they want. Obama never got an authorization for Libya. He just did it anyway. But then if a president tries to end a war, all the Liz Cheney's will jump up and screech and say the president has no right. And they'll try to pass a law. In fact, they did. They passed a law a year ago to prevent Trump from spending money on removing forces from Afghanistan, which they had no authority to do. And he, of course, can could have ordered those troops to move wherever he said. He just didn't say. But Wait, they can't do that because I, I thought that they had uh, the power of the purse. Yeah, but when it comes to where he's allowed to move soldiers, they can't dictate that. What are they going to do about it? He's the commander in chief. The military is not going to say, well, I don't know. The Congress says I shouldn't. If he ordered them to move, they would have to move. And then right. let the Congress try to sue him over it. And you know already that the court would 
either way, whether it was for or against the war, the court would defer and say, this is a political fight between y'all and not a legal fight for us. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, which is them ducking it, but that's what they do. Ron Paul and some others tried to sue Bill Clinton over Kosovo, and the court said, we're not going to rule on this. You guys figure it out. If you don't like him going to war without a declaration, impeach him. Don't bring well, it, it to the it, SC. And that's what happened with Yemen, too, if I remember correctly, is uh, they passed a resolution trying to say, hey, you don't have a, a, a power to, to send troops into Yemen, Donald Trump. And uh, they, they tried to stop him. And he just vetoed it and did it anyway. Yeah, it was the War Powers Resolution is what they invoked. Yeah. And, which itself is an unconstitutional grant of authority to the president, but it also has restrictions in it. And they tried to invoke the restrictions and he just vetoed it and went on anyway. And again, that was a war that was never authorized in the first place. They just hide behind the doctrine of leading from behind and calling it the Saudi-led coalition when America's the empire and they're our client state. And America's been responsible for every part of the war. Yeah, and that's what's kind of frustrating about uh, talking about Donald Trump as the uh, the anti-war candidate. Is, it, it, I admit he did, um, in, in a certain sense, get Republicans talking about ending wars in a way they hadn't in a while. But then it, it, like every everything he did, every action he did seemed to do uh, – seem to kind of affirm the absolute opposite, where he just increased the war. Uh, you know, he started a war in Yemen, really, and put soldiers in there. He uh, increased all the other wars we were in. Um, yeah, I don't know. So yeah. what, do you, what do you think about uh, uh, Joe Biden's uh, assurance that we will have the troops home from Afghanistan here in a couple months? Uh, do you think there's any chance of that actually uh, coming to be? Well, they're pulling all the infantry out, and I, apparently the Green Berets, you know, they'll be leaving very top-tier special operations forces, probably, and the CIA, and they'll still be spending a lot of money backing Afghan forces there. But you think uh, that and overall they're going to be pulling, it, it sounds like more yes, or less they're going to I mean, be pulling they, a lot out. Yes, they have closed down the Kandahar Air Base, they've closed down all actions in the Helmand province, and I don't know exactly what all is going on in Nangarhar. There may be... Uh, well, I shouldn't say that about Hellman. I, I, I'm under the impression that they pulled out all the Marines. I don't know what they have. Maybe they have some forces in Lashkar Ga, the provincial capital there. And there there could still be Green Berets uh, in Nangar province. I know that the Delta Force, you know, half a year ago, the Delta Force told the Washington Post and the New York Times that they were, uh, they called themselves, they even had a plaque in their little office where they call themselves the Taliban Air Force because they were flying for the ta flying drones for the Taliban against uh, what they call Islamic State fighters there in um, the Nangarhar province. And so there may be some of that continuing, you know, um, it's, it's horrible. I'm sure they're killing innocent people, but at least it goes to show that the Taliban have an interest in eliminating any competition to their monopoly on violence if it means, you know, these kinds of terrorist groups as well. They always were extremely hard asses, but they bring law and order one way or the other. And so this is a compromise the Americans have found to make. It's really the same thing as they did with the awakening in Iraq, where the local Iraqis, um, you know, uh, welcomed all these foreign fighters to come and be suicide bombers and killers on their behalf. And then, but later... They struck a deal with the Americans that actually they'd kill all these terrorists if the Americans would stop killing them. They'd have a truce with us and turn on the worst part of their own faction. And so that's in a sense what's going on here, right, is the Afghan awakening as America is tilting toward the Taliban as long as they'll fight the foreign fighters, which really just means a bunch of Pakistanis from across the line. It's not like their ISIS in Afghanistan is really international terrorists. It's a bunch of lies. But um, anyway... Um, you know, the, they're pulling the bulk of the force out of the Bagram Air Base as well. I mean, I always said that I don't see that the Pentagon will ever give that base up, but it comes down to it. If the president says you're giving it up, you're giving it up, and they're destroying all of their stuff that they can't bring with them. And they're saying now, the New York Times said the other day, they plan on being out by July, not September. They think they can do it by July. Now, I saw footage of men lined up getting on a 737 or whatever it was, 757, getting the hell out of there. And so, again, they're going to leave the CIA. 
and they're going to leave top tier special operations forces and they want to leave air power over the horizon they say which i guess means f-18s in the indian ocean but i mean really it's just a matter of time before the taliban takes the capital city i think maybe a peace deal can be won but i kind of doubt it and i think they're they know that all of the momentum is with them the fighting season is just beginning and they're just taking cap you know out in the countryside they're just taking over district after district after district wherever there was even a little bit of opposition left it's melting away and the local afghan security forces are turning tail and run which just goes to show what a potemkin village this always was anybody thinks we'd stay there another 50 years to install this same regime in power has to admit that look at what a house of cards it was the thing is a joke and the local police and local security forces are all turning around and running away because they yeah, have nothing sure like the lesson. support they would need among the population to stave off this other faction. It's not like the population is welcoming the Taliban in. But they're sure not rallying around the government we've created for them to save them from them either, are they? And so that just goes to show whether that we've done this 10 years ago or 10 years from now or another 20 years from now. It's the same outcome. And it's going to be ugly as hell, pal, because we've been putting in power people who cannot stay in power. And so when the hell comes to pay, it's going to be bloody. I mean, we can hope for the best, but I don't expect anything less than a real catastrophe. The question is just what are you going to do about it? You already, it's because our government made it this way. It's just like a housing bubble. You, punch, you funnel a bunch of money into housing you artificially increase the value of those houses one day or another the correction is coming due and it's going to crash back down again well now we're talking about the value of the power of certain afghan factions who are pumped up just like housing by funny american money and by american guns and drones but now the correction is coming there's a crash coming and their natural amount of power the natural price that people are willing to pay to do what they say will be discovered. And it's going to be a lot less than our government's been insisting this whole time. And, you know, by the way, damn George W. Bush, who let it be known that when Joe Biden called him to say, listen, I'm ending the war, pal, that he told Joe Biden, OK, I accept that. And I, I guess everything's been done that could be done. And that's fine. Because what's he going to say? No, -uh, if you just want to put Stephen Hadley and General Loot back in there, they'll solve it for you, just like they didn't for me. Uh, what's he going to say? So, um, but then he comes out a week later and goes, oh, I fear for the future of Afghan women if we leave. Oh, yeah? What about the present of Afghan women while we're there? And what about the inevitability of the absolute increase in Taliban political power over the people of that country when we leave one day or the other. And what about how brutal the Hazars and the Tajiks and the Uzbeks are to their women too? And the Taliban might be worse in some ways, but then again, you know, the American warlords, the, the warlords backed by the United States in the Afghan war all along have been absolute monsters. People who are ab just serial killers and the worst sorts of, of child rapists and drug dealers and throat-cutting mercenary, absolute bastards who have no moral authority higher than the Taliban whatsoever. At least the Taliban believe in their own religious piety and in some sense of law and order and not just outright degeneracy like the people America's been supporting in power there. What about the women? Well, what about the little boys? who are the victims of the people that America's been foisting on these people for a generation. Right, and it's not like we couldn't have seen this coming, too. I mean, this is the exact same thing that happened uh, back with, what, the Mujahideen in the 1980s, uh, it, and even going back further than that with the uh, the invasion of the British Empire and the, uh, was it, the Seleucid dynasty there. I, I, I mean, this is the exact same thing that happened both times. It, it's just, it's not like we couldn't have predicted that this was the exact outcome, is that there was no way to win in Afghanistan. It's just, it, it's absolutely impossible to conquer that country. 
Yeah. And look, what right do we have? I had a guy come at me on Twitter. I don't know if he's some robot. Maybe it was the AI and I was arguing with a robot. But the guy says, look, man, if we destroy these countries, don't we owe it to them to fix it? Don't we owe them something? I feel really no. bad about just pulling out and leaving them in the lurch. And it's like, yeah, but <laughs> what evidence is there that staying and killing more people helps anyone? Like, this just stays an article of faith, despite the fact that all we've done is kill and destroy this whole time. Somehow we're going to kill and destroy our way out of it. And it reminds me, it's actually a real quote from Hillary Clinton. I saw her say it myself with my own eyes and ears. She said, listen, when you're in a hole, and in fact, she was specifically talking about Afghanistan. Listen, when you're in a hole, you've got to grab a shovel and start digging. Wow. Because that's all they can think of to do. You know, which is, that's exactly what Chief Wiggum said on The Simpsons, right? No, dig up, <laughs> stupid. Right, because yeah. and then they just keep digging further down because that's all you can do. Yeah, I remember that. Oh my god, I know. Yeah, that's horrible. Oh my god. Um, so uh, I I kind of want to shift here a little bit and ask you uh, about um, we've been talking a lot about foreign policy and uh, let's see where is it? I I remember you saying specifically to uh, uh Dave Smith that uh, the most important aspect of a presidency or a nation state is foreign policy. Uh, and I think that might not be maybe immediately apparent to some people why foreign policy uh, is the most important and, wh and, and why you uh, focus on that so much. And, and I mean, why I'm interested in talking to you about that so much, really. Um, and I'm wondering, can you expand on that and kind of explain uh, what you mean or maybe uh, even pitch to people who've never really considered that before or who may even disagree with that concept about foreign policy and uh, why that's really just uh, on so many levels the most important aspect of uh, 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 politics, especially in America today. Sure. Well, listen, um, I really picked up on this when I was 14, pretty sure, and went and saw the movie JFK. And regardless of what you think about all the different aspects of the movie, there's one scene in there where Donald Sutherland is uh, represents uh, Mr. X, who's uh, supposed to represent Fletcher Prouty, a former uh, military covert operations officer. And he's sitting on a park bench in Washington, D.C., explaining the facts of life to the uh, New Orleans District Attorney, Jim Garrison, who's trying to prosecute the conspiracy case. And they're sitting on a park bench on the mall, and he's saying, you see all these statues, all this white marble and all this, you know, what it is, what is all this? What's it for? What does it mean? This U.S. national government, Washington, D.C., what's the point? It's the war power. That is the organizing principle of any society. The control over the monopoly on the right to use armed force, to initiate armed force. The people who make it illegal for you to do so have the authority to do so in order to enforce the law against you. That's what it means. And it also means, of course, on the large scale, the power to build up military forces to fight and protect against foreign states. But that means, though, that people will kill each other over this power. People will do anything to control this power because it's the question of whether we're working on the uh, arc of crisis in Central Asia or whether we're doing Likud's work in Iraq. It's the question of, are we buying $40 billion worth of Lockheed products this year or is Raytheon going to win out? And for the foreign powers involved, it means everything in terms of what they can do to try to control and influence American foreign policy to serve their ends. And the thing is, if we're just talking about Norway or something who essentially sit out everything and aren't a militarized state and don't really mess with anyone and have, you know, sort of the protection of their allied neighboring states around and whatever, then this might sound like kind of a silly conversation. Sure, they run the federal police and the judiciary and the welfare services and stuff like that, but mostly people, I think, probably consider them a service organization of some kind. But America 
It's not a constitutional republic. America is the world empire. America is the most heavily militarized state on the face of the planet. And we spend more than 10 times the next country to us. And when we spend more than all the next 10 countries or even more combined together every year, our Navy dominates every ocean and sea on the planet. Our CIA dominates every national government of any importance anywhere on the planet. Um, and we have military bases in, you know, something like, um, you know, more than 100 countries of probably more than 150 countries out of 192 or so in the whole world. You know, in other words, like more than a majority and maybe a super majority of countries in the world have some kind of American military base and are dependent on our goodwill for their trade relations with their neighbors and with us and with everybody else. We can put sanctions on Iran and we can tell any country in the world, if you do business with Iran, then we'll put sanctions on you. And they have no choice but to bow down to that because America is a world empire. And so the level, the amount of power there means then, well, first of all, all the corruption that comes with it, all the wealth that comes with it, as James Madison, the father of the Constitution, the principal author of the Constitution, wrote that war is the germ of every other abuse of liberty because it means big budgets and big honors for, right. for military men. And so it vests them with a huge interest and not just the generals, but everyone around them, everyone involved in supplying them with all of their needs, their guns, their boots and everything else, and everyone involved in the thing. And it gives power to government officials to pass out all of those favors and then to collect their own favors back one day and all these things. And all of this is just absolutely contrary to the principles of having a limited constitutional republic. And so then when we have a world empire abroad, then that means that we have, look at it, absolutely astronomical, uncalculable, almost inconceivable amounts of corruption in our society here, where our Bill of Rights reads like a dead letter, where cops run around like the Gestapo, killing two or three people every single day of the year with no accountability whatsoever, militarized by the Pentagon and trained by the Israelis in you know, tactics for occupation of conquered people. And yeah, it, all well, these things that are the, and the boom and the bust that comes from the inflationary money that's printed to make it all seem free leads to, you know, absolute dislocation and, and just societal disruption from the very real busts that come from the artificial booms. And we see this over and over again, just in my lifetime. From the Reagan buildup, we had the massive crash of the late 80s. From the Bush and Bill Clinton buildup, instead of cashing our peace dividend at the end of the Cold War, they expanded the world empire. And we had the massive crash of the bubble in the dot coms and all of that that crashed in 99, 2000. And then they just kept pumping money into the housing market, built up the bubble, kept the bubble going. And then that crashed in 2008, bringing the whole dang world down with it and leading to an extra few hundred thousand suicides and and thousands more murder suicides as people destroy their entire family before blowing their own brains out after the destruction, the economic absolute devastation of you know tens of millions of Americans uh, from that crash. And and then and on it goes, right? We had the crash. We were due for a crash last year. But the lockdowns forced it anyway. That was essentially the recession that we were overdue. They didn't raise interest rates. They just locked everybody up. And that led to, of course, a lot of bankruptcies and a lot of bad debts being liquidated and, and massive deflationary pressure as though we had a real recession. But then what? Then they just create another jillion dollars and get everything back on the road again. we got a whole new Cold War against Russia and China to build up for now. We can't afford to husband our resources. We can't, um, you know, focus on ourselves. We have these higher priorities and the American people have to buy a new generation of long range bombers. And it turns out 
the F-35 and the literal combat ship are both trillion dollar total worthless disgraces of boondoggles. We're just going to have to start up a whole new battleship program and a whole new fifth, sixth generation fighter, whatever BS generation they're on now for the fighter jets and to just keep the whole thing going, which just means we're going to have a whole new and, and it's already happening in housing and in fuel and all over the place. And we're going to have another huge bubble. And I don't know when the crash is going to come, but it'll be come and decimate our economy and our society again. And then every time this happens, of course, free market capitalism takes the rap, even though the problem is militarism and cronyism and corporatism and corruption and the, and an inflationary monetary policy that makes it all possible. And so that's it. You can have a republic or an empire, but you can't have it both ways. And the reason America sucks is because it's an empire. And I don't really believe in karma because that just kind of makes it sound magic or whatever, but it's just, it is what it is. You militarize your national government over the planet. Don't be surprised when they militarize your local sheriff's department against you. You know, it's the American right wing right now are going, oh my God, they're turning the war on terrorism against us. Yeah, well, who supported the war on terrorism all along? American right? Pretty late in the day to learn your lesson here. If you're paying attention at all, uh, what war on terrorism is that that's turning against you? The very same one we've had all along that we never had to have at all. But I'm just mad that it's going to rain all weekend and we're supposed to all go camping. So I don't know what the hell's going to happen now, but I guess we'll just get wet. Oh, shit. Sorry. I, yeah, I didn't know you had plans going on. Um, Yeah. All right, well, I'm um, pack up the truck. Where are you heading? Childerberg. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're a bunch of drunken libertarians at the lake west of town. But, uh, boy, it looks like it's really going to be wet out there. So I don't know how it's going to go. But hopefully people still show up. Yeah. Luke bring extra changes to clothes. Try not to get struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, thanks very much for having me on again, dude. Good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you coming on again, man. Happy to do it. Yeah. All right.